Each country that we visit has a story to tell. One of our goals for this year is to not only connect with the land, but with the people who carry the tales of each country's rich history. Against 40,000 and all those ships, the Maltese had 500 knights and about 6,000 men. It was an impossible situation. You think that's a miracle? Oh, it is. I, I, I tell you about a miracle. Come along as Francesco and his daughter Marie take us on a journey through the horrors and miracles of Malta's past. We can't wait for you to join us as we celebrate the life of this incredible man and the bravery of the Maltese people. You'll find all of that and more right here in our Malta finale. Hi, we're Danny and Kev, and we just quit our jobs at Disney to travel the world for a year. Through travel hacking, we flew from Florida to Madrid, and the past couple weeks, we've been spending our time in a small country in the Mediterranean called Malta. I had never heard of Malta before this trip, but after experiencing the attractions, crystal blue waters, learning about the rich history, and talking to the locals, we could tell you firsthand that this is a country that we would highly recommend adding to your bucket list. We enjoyed it so much that we made three videos about it. Dad? Francesco Cochi. And how old are you? I am 27. <laughs> <laughs> 92. 92. 92 years young. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tomorrow he's 92. Happy early Happy birthday. Happy birthday! During World War II, the island of Malta was one of the most heavily bombarded islands in the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, Francesco is one of the few survivors left that lived to tell their story of World War II. When the war started, I was nine years old. And the only defense we had was three gladiators. Hope, faith, and charity. Germans, uh, the Messerschmitt 109, superior fighter. The gladiators were no match. Mm. They were hammered. Day and night airways. Yeah. Day and night airways. Oh, people used to go in the evening with their blanket in the shirt, their sleep. We never did anyway because so crowded. Imagine. All those people sleeping in there. Oh, terrible. You can't imagine sleeping down here while you're being bombed above you. You can see the like chisel marks that they... There's like straight lines. During World War II, the island of Malta was heavily bombarded by the Germans and the Italians. Being right in the middle of the Mediterranean, it was a very sought after piece of land. It was being bombed so much so that the citizens carved out these bomb shelters underneath the streets, where a lot of families spent many evenings probably very fearful of what was to come when they came out. We are in the World War II bomb shelter, which is just below the Mosta Dome, where something remarkable happened. Do you remember when the bomb hit the rotunda? That bomb, there was a mass going on. The church was full. If that, took, if that took off, it killed a lot of people. There was what, two or three hundred people in there? I should say about three, four hundred. The more we learned about this story, the more unbelievable it became. After hearing the story from Francesco, we had to go check out the Mosta Dome for ourselves. We would later find out that three high-powered explosive bombs were dropped on the Basilica. Two were deflected, and the one that penetrated the ceiling crashed into a picture of Jesus, then ricocheted into a tombstone on the marble floor. The 300 people in attendance watched as it rolled into the middle of the mass, awaiting its detonation. But to their surprise, it never went off. You think that's a miracle? Oh, it is. I, I, I tell you about a miracle. We were living in Paola, next to the dockyard. It's uh, a church with uh, Holy Mary. The church was 12 feet from the submarine dock. One time, uh, uh, an air raid came, destroyed a lot of houses. But that church never been touched. Not a splinter. I mean, I believe in miracles. What about your dad? Because he was in the Merchant Navy. He was in the Navy. Tell him, how many people were on the ship? What was the ship called? Nothing the Courageous, if I remember. 
aircraft carrier. 950 people went down with that. He was a chief engineer. That moment he was up with the captain. Otherwise he would have gone too. Yeah. And if you think being blown off an aircraft carrier is where the story ends, just wait. We got a telegram tell us that he is missing. After a while, to about three months, we were sitting on the front step, me and my brother, and uh, we see a man walking from one side to a drunk, <laughs> absolutely off his mind. And, <laughs> and my brother said, look at him. He had one too many. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, I stand, Gerard. Wait, where was he? In Egypt. In Egypt? Oh. Yes. What, what was he doing there? Well, he was in the Navy and oh. his ship was in, in uh, Alexandria. Wow. When he got ashore, he was something to do with the traffic, okay. military that when an air raid comes, all the vehicles got to spread. One of them hit him. We went to see him. <laughs> Choke from head That's to so head. How are you, Dad? Good <laughs> it so bad. So he survived? Yes, he did survive. He was a strong man, my dad. And then what happened to him? Oh, then one night, oh my God. A lightning? hit our house, killed mom, dad, and my eldest brother in one night. Were you there in the house? We were 11, family of 11, and only three got killed. Yeah, they were all in the house. So who was the oldest at that time? His older brother, Joe. How old was he at the time? When he died, Joe was 26. Six foot three he was. Big boy. Yeah. Big, big boy, yes, he was a big boy. Hearing some of Francesco's stories really puts things into perspective. When you're going through those hard times, when you look at people like Francesco, who's just the things that he's been through in his life, it's unimaginable. And he was able to get through it and carry on to see better days. On the uh, 15th of August, in St. Mary's Day, three ships appeared coming in in the harbor. We were starving. We, there were nothing. You know, what we had from the farmers, not many farmers, more that's not big. We had to uh, rely on what's coming in, you know, there's nothing comes in. It was absolutely, oh, so bad. In order to help revive the island, the English launched Operation Pedestal, sending 14 ships to the island with fuel, food, and supplies. Unfortunately, most of those ships ended up at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And just as the Maltese were about to surrender, a miracle happened. A few of the ships entered the harbor during St. Mary's holiday. That's why they often referred to those boats as the Santa Maria Convoy, thus giving us a huge celebration that they have called the Festa Santa Maria. We're really excited for this evening. The owners of the hotel, now I feel like a part of our family, have invited us to the rooftop to observe the fireworks and celebrate the festival. So we will be joining them with all of their immediate family and we are stoked about it. Let the party begin. Let's go. We are so honored to get to hear Francesco's stories. It's our hope that his voice is heard around the world and is shared with many generations to come. If you like this segment, please give it a thumbs up and let us know in the comments below. Our next destination of Vienna, Austria was voted on by our friends on Instagram. 
If you aren't already a part of our Instagram family and want to join in on the fun, head over and keep on the lookout for our next poll. Oh, and before we go, here's a bonus clip of Marie telling her favorite Malta story. Great siege of Malta. Yes. Yeah. When we beat the Turks. When we beat the Turks, that's right. So what really happened was a few years previous to the siege, the Maltese and the Knights of St. John had got news that the Turks were coming to invade them. And they tried to use every minute to build the forts, prepare themselves. They didn't know when they were coming. And by some miracle, by the time it happened, they were prepared. But it was a tough battle. The Turks took a lot of prisoners and the Maltese took a lot of prisoners. And when they ran out of ammunition, they beheaded the lot all the prisoners, and they used those as cannonballs against the Turks. Against 40,000 and all those ships, the Maltese had 500 knights and about 6,000 men. It was an impossible situation. And um, it took four months, uh, but the Maltese did win, and uh, really it was uh, a miracle. And in the end, the Turks gave up and they set sail and they lost a majority of their men and the Maltese didn't lose that many. So it's just one of those situations. Go check it out, the Siege of Malta. It's a fascinating story oh, yes. how the Ottoman Empire, which ruled a lot of the world at that time, he won all the Crusades, he gave Christianity, he wanted it damned. We were the infidels and uh, they were pretty brutal. So the chances of us winning, and a lot of it was arm-to-arm -arm combat as well, you know, with the knights. Because Malta is really a strategic place in the Mediterranean. You can go in all four, south, north, east and west, to, you know, Tripoli or Sicily or Spain or Greece. And so you're right in the middle of the Mediterranean here to be stationed. Napoleon wanted it. He didn't succeed. And... Um, they called the British at that time to come and help them, which is how Malta became uh, part of the British Commonwealth. Um, and in the end, in 1963, they did get their freedom from the British, but uh, it's just a little tiny island with a lot of courage. <laughs>